Oh, okay. We're good. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the council. I'm your host, Charlie Pacello, and we've got a great show lined up for you today. I'm so grateful for all of you being on the show with me today. And I just want to do a quick shout out to Remax Alliance. Uh, they're the sponsors of our show. Remax Alliance. Go to www.homesincolorado.com. That's homesincolorado.com. Uh, if you want to buy or sell a home, uh, they're the people to go to. They're the number one real estate uh, company in Colorado, and I know them personally. And please, if you're uh, if you're in need and you're looking to buy or sell. Go to Remax Alliance. Uh, they'll take care of you. Let them know that uh, I recommended you, and uh, they'll take care of you. And, and you're gonna you're gonna be very happy that you went there. So Remax Alliance uh, again. www.homesincolorado.com. Um, quick thing that I have to share um, is a new book that just came out. It's called War and Moral Injury. Uh, it is a book that uh, deals with uh, one of the signature wounds of war, um, and moral injury is something that is a real problem. It's a real issue that a lot of veterans uh, go through when they're dealing with uh, the trials and tri tribulations that come with war, and the consequences of having to make moral decisions. And uh, it's a book that just recently came out. Uh, it's uh, got... Uh, letters and, and stories written by reporters and uh, other veterans and chaplains and uh, experts in the field. Uh, I'm very honored to be included in this uh, anthology. It's my first publication and uh, it's a really a huge, uh, tremendous contribution to moral injury and the consequences that are faced by uh, veterans that uh, are asked to do um, to do our, our, the things that they do in war and to be able to uh, do things that their mind tells them to do that their heart knows is wrong and uh, the consequences that come with that. So please pick it up. All proceeds uh, of the book go to Soldier's Heart. Uh, Soldier's Heart is dedicated to the healing and renewal of veterans coming back from conflict. These things can last for a long time. Traumas can last a very long time. So just because it doesn't show up now doesn't mean it doesn't show up later. So all of the proceeds go to Soldier's Heart so we can take care of and bring all the vets back home, uh, all those who have served our country. So please purchase it, read it, become informed, become wiser. Uh, let us become a, a more compassionate society and uh, look at the things that we do to others uh, who are here the call to service and are asked to do the things that uh, most of us would not want to do. So please pick it up, War and Moral Injury, a reader, uh, edited by Robert Emmett Mager and Douglas A. Pryor. Uh, and it's a fantastic book, really, really, in, really important book uh, for our society. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about trauma. Uh, we've been doing a lot on the show, uh, kind of talking about spirituality and healing, and now I want to get back into some of the nitty-gritty of life and the things that people face uh, when they're faced with a traumatic injury. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I've been uh, asked the question about how do you know when someone's injured? How do you know that uh, someone is traumatized? And I've been doing my practice uh, for a long time now. And uh, when I work with clients and I interview them, um, you know, I, I can see and, and notice just some by some of their characteristics and some of their behaviors, how they act and, you know, what their response to trauma is. If... Uh, 
if you're not aware of the characteristics of trauma, you or someone you love, you may not know, you may not be able to, to recognize it. So it's important that we go through it and then be able to look at how we can face our shadows and embrace our tragedies and make peace with our past. So, you know, what does trauma look like? You know, what are, what are the ways in which people cope with trauma? in their lives and how does this reflect in their relationships and work and in social situations. You know, I know from my own experience, you know, when I did, when I coped because of the traumas that I had experienced in my life, you know, I drank a lot and I did drugs to medicate myself from the pain. I stopped doing the things that I once loved. I became very reticent and withdrawn from people. Uh, I was chronically depressed. I escaped by watching TV or reading books uh, or depriving myself of the things or money or, you know, good stuff that would be, you know, good for me because I had this core belief that I was unworthy. And this unworthiness is really part, very, is that a lot of the core of what people experience who experience trauma. And all these things and more were ways that I unconsciously and consciously dealt with the traumas that I had experienced uh, and was experiencing in my life. And I didn't have the courage to seek help. Uh, I didn't have the courage to face the painful emotions brought on by these traumatic events and find a way to transform and integrate them into the fabric of my life in a healthy and positive way. You know, now that I have, I can't believe I allowed my to be in that state of quiet desperation for so long. And it's as though I didn't, I, on some level, I felt like I didn't deserve to live or feel good again about my life. And as I stated before, traumas change the way your brains function. It alters the chemicals and the hormones that are released into the body, and therefore one's life is significantly detoured because the way you process life has become damaged. And traumas get lodged in our bodies as well as in the painful recollection of the memories of our past. It's like a part of us gets frozen in time you're trapped in that original traumatic experience. And unless we do something to heal our minds and our bodies from the effects of the trauma, we become unconscious victims of our own coping strategies as we try to resolve these issues and within us and eliminate the pain. Unfortunately, because when we haven't learned, yet learned the tools effectively to heal from these wounds, we make matters worse by falling into these destructive coping strategies that only compound and complicate the problem. All stress becomes traumatic whenever there is danger, fear, anxiety, or risk involved. Your body ends up mobilizing defenses. Everything goes on high alert, and there's this heightened state of alertness and vigilance. The electro, uh, excuse me, the electrochemical reactions between the synapses in your brain accelerate. It's like you're driving your car at maximum speed. You know, everything is being pushed to the limits, and pretty soon everything breaks down. So our minds and our bodies are, can only take so much. We all, we all have a breaking point. And often these traumas have a residual effect, you know, meaning they don't show up until later in life, sometimes much later. And now some traumas, they have an immediate effect. Uh, you know, they only happen once or a few times, but the impact is so great, it immediately affects our lives. You know, examples of this are combat, rape, assault or physical abuse, or severe accidents. Other types of traumas are very small, are, are much smaller, and they happen little by little every single day. But the cumulative effect of these relatively minor traumas can have just as significant an effect on a person as a major event. Just little acts of degradation, humiliation, guilt or shame on a daily basis takes their toll on a victim until one day they just completely fall apart. And we often make compromises to trauma which deadens us over time. We lose our our sensitivity to what we once had, the joy we had, the sense of well-being and aliveness. I mean, we feel all this dread and sadness and depression, and it can be overwhelming. And it's only when we remove ourselves from the situation, heal ourselves from the pains of our past, does this sensitivity 
and joy return. But so often we're just caught up in the cycles of trauma that we can't seem to find our way out. And we keep repeating things over and over again. And if we only knew what the signs were to, that indicated that we had been traumatized and that we needed to heal our wounds, wouldn't we do it? If we knew what they were, then maybe we could recognize our coping behaviors in our own lives and see how we were doing damage to ourselves and then seek the help out there to change these coping strategies into healthy ones. Now, these are the work that I do with my clients, and you can go to www.charliepacello.com. That's charliepacello.com. I am open to new clients. I have room for new clients, and this is the work that I'm dedicated to do. A lot of the people that I have learned from have helped me along the way, and one of them was a guy by the name of Dr. Patrick J. Carnes. He's a... Uh, uh, a doctor who's broken down trauma and continues that has continued to affect people. And he wrote a book called The Betrayal Bond. And he's an expert, Dr. Carnes is, in the field of addiction, um, recovery, and compulsivity. And his book elucidates the profound impact traumas have on people. Now, his book breaks down trauma into eight different ways in which people cope. They are trauma reaction, trauma arousal, Trauma blocking, trauma splitting, trauma abstinence, trauma shame, trauma repetition, and trauma bonds. Now, for the purposes of this show today, I'm just going to focus on the first seven because uh, the, the, the last one, the trauma bonds, that's a whole other show to work on. Uh, but if you would like to understand that one in depth, uh, I recommend buying Dr. Carnes' book. Uh, it's well worth the read and explains how and why we get involved in exploitative relationships. However, uh, what I want you to understand is how you cope with traumas. And Dr. Carnes has listed him specifically all the characteristics for each one, and which I'm going to share with you, uh, and I will explain each one specifically. Uh, very grateful to Dr. Carnes for the work that he has done in helping to push and move trauma understanding and recovery uh, ahead. And he's made it very easy to understand. So the first one is trauma reaction. Basically, a man has horrifying nightmares and he can recall hearing the sounds of the war going on around him. The exploding bombs in the air, the chattering of machine guns, the thud of mortar rounds being fired and the cries of men wounded and dying. You know, he's suddenly aroused by his wife who's being attacked well, by him in his sleep. And he finally comes back to reality. It was so real. It was so vivid. And he has no idea how to get rid of these terrible dreams. And so to cope, he drinks, which ends up only complicating the problem because then his guard is down and the beast comes out and he is easily provoked to rage. Now, this is just one example of post-traumatic stress disorder or what I like to call post-traumatic soul distress. Now, as I've stated in previous shows, PTSD is not limited to just veterans, okay? It's people who've experienced physically or emotionally abusive relationships, accidents, disasters, or any kind of traumatic event where there was an overwhelming sense of fear, terror, and danger that can get PTSD. And one of the problematical issues with PTSD is how the alarm system in the brain is activated. An overwhelming sense of fear and danger causes extraordinary changes in your neurological system and your organs, especially, in particular, your brain. And these changes in your body, especially in your brain, alters how you perceive and relate to the world around you. Most people whose fight or flight response system is working properly, they react in response to an emergency or crisis and then return to normal. Those who suffer from PTSD have experienced trauma, which is so overwhelming and sustained that the entire body's ability to stay in a hypervigilant state is enhanced. The body adjusts as does the mind. You just can't slow down. You can't slow down. And the accelerator is down. You're on full throttle all the time. Everybody else is at a different speed. And the result is you're a highly reactive, difficult person 
who is a challenge to be around and who doesn't want to be like this. Now, characteristics of PTSD reactivity. Recurrent and unwanted intrusive recollections and experiences. Periods of sleeplessness. Sudden real memories that are vivid and distracting. Extremely cautious of your surroundings. Startled more easily than others. Distressing dreams about experiences. Flashback episodes. Acting or feeling as if the experience is happening in the present, because where the memory is stored is in the back, is in the right hemisphere of the brain, and that part all it makes it feel like it's happening right now. Distress when exposed to reminders of experiences like anniversaries, places, or symbols. Outbursts of anger and irritability, distrust of others, physical reactions of. Reminders of experiences. You break out into a cold sweat. You have trouble breathing. So if you see these characteristics in yourself or someone you love, if they're exhibiting some of these, chances are your loved one suffers from PTSD. Let's take a look at trauma arousal. When people are affected in coping with tra by trauma arousal, some people in their lives only feel alive when they are dealing with crises or taking high risks. Soldiers coming back from war often engage in high-risk sexual behavior because it stimulates a system and helps them to dull the pain they experience from the war. Women who were sexually abused or raped when they were young, often when they become adults, can only become orgasmic when a man is hurting them. And they will find partners who will re-victimize them over and over again because the behavior is now supercharged and addictive. Now, as Dr. Carnes points out in his book, quote, stimulation and pleasure compensate for pain and emptiness, end quote. With sex alone, the possibilities for arousal based on fear or danger is endless. There's highly addictive sex, violence, dramatic exits, passionate reconciliation, threats of leaving, seeking sex outside the relationship through prostitution or anonymous sex. This and more constitute just one of the pathways people who've been traumatized use to seek stimulation and pleasure especially in the presence of fear, danger, violence, abandonment, or shame. Now, characteristics of its presence are engaging in high-risk, thrill-seeking endeavors, behaviors such as skydiving or race car driving, seeking more risk because the, the last jolt of excitement wasn't enough, you know, difficulty being alone, calmer in low-stress environments, using drugs like cocaine or amphetamines to speed things up to heighten uh, high-risk activities, feeling sexual when frightened or when violence occurs, seeking high-risk sex, loving to gamble on outcomes, difficulty completing sustained and steady tasks, always seeking danger, constantly searching for all-or-nothing situations, and associating with people who are dangerous to you. See, arousal can become very addictive. And those who have been traumatized <clears throat> may need the heightened stimulation and high-risk pleasure seeking just to feel normal. And when your brain adjusts to this way of living, it can really severely disrupt your life and cause you and those you love a lot of pain. Let's look at trauma blocking. Now, blocking is an effort to, uh, by the survivor to numb, to block out, or reduce the residual negative feelings associated with the trauma. You will do anything to obliterate the painful memories and feelings of the interior world. It's about anxiety reduction, and you will do behaviors and substances that induce calm, relaxation, and comfort. You're basically anesthetizing yourself from the fear and pain of your past. And you want to avoid reality because reality is just too painful. But again, as the body and mind adjust, you will need to do these things compulsively in order to feel normal. 
Some of the characteristics are excessive drinking, use of depressant drugs or downers, using TV, reading, or hobbies as a way to numb out, compulsive eating, excessive sleeping, compulsive working, especially at unrewarding jobs, compulsive exercise, binging with any of the above that I've just described when things are difficult. Any kind of trauma can create this kind of response in order to cope. But by choosing to act out in these ways, you're changing the neural pathways in your brain and your ability to function normally is impaired. And often many survivors of trauma use a combination of these strategies to cope, which only compounds the problem and makes it more difficult to break free from the painful past. Let's look at trauma splitting. Sometimes the reality you are living in is just too painful to bear and you want to go to another place. You want to escape. And therapists uh, call this splitting, where the victim of the trauma splits off from the uncomfortable reality, literally dissociates from the experience and lives in another reality or fantasy. And this can take many forms. Amnesia is one of them where the survivor doesn't remember significant facts about the event. And sometimes survivors find themselves in places where they have no idea how they got there. <laughs> they just uh, wake up like, how did I get here? <laughs> and sometimes they feel detached from their bodies while in reality. And this happened to me a lot. Or the lights are on, but nobody's home. Because they have completely detached themselves from the reality of their world. And this living in fantasy land becomes addictive because the survivor's fantasies are often accompanied by arousal and obsession. Now, sex addicts will have a pattern of falling in love. And when the romance subsides, they'll seek another to fulfill the thrill of romance and believe this is the one who will take all my pain away. An alcoholic will think he is a wine connoisseur to cover up his alcoholism. Both of these examples illustrate how one dissociates from their painful realities. And thus trauma splitting is really ignoring the realities by splitting off the experiences you're escaping and not integrating them into yourself, into your personality and your daily life. Now, characteristics of trauma splitting are fantasizing, or spacing out during plays or movies that generate intense feelings or are reminders of painful experiences. Experiencing confusion, absent-mindedness and forgetfulness because of preoccupation. Living in a fantasy world where things get tough. Feeling separated from the body as a reaction to a flashback. Experiencing amnesia about what you are doing and where you are and being preoccupied with something else than what needs to be attended to. You're having life in compartments that others do not know about. Living a double life. Daydreaming, living in an unreal world. And obsessing around addictive behaviors. And losing yourself in romantic fantasies. And the use of marijuana or psychedelic drugs. It can become a way of just splitting yourself off from reality. And we all want to space, off, space out sometimes. The problem is, is when we want to stay there. Let's take a look at trauma abstinence. Sometimes survivors of trauma will engage in compulsive deprivation or abstinence as a way to control and manage their fears, anxieties, and stresses about their lives. Now this type of response as a solution to a traumatic experience occurs especially around memories of success, high stress, shame, or anxiety. The most important is this response is driven by terror and fear. And when a person deprives themselves of good things, spending money for themselves, avoiding eating healthy foods, sabotaging opportunities for success, it's a way of reinforcing the core belief that you are unworthy. For example, people can use debt as a form of impoverishment and self-fulfillment. 
They cannot seem to get ahead or make any moves to improve their lives because of the overwhelming debt burden resting on their shoulders. So this becomes a poverty obsession, obsession where you deny yourself basic needs and avoid taking risks on opportunities that might lift you from the financial constraints you find yourself in. However, this constantly depriving yourself of the good things in life as a counterforce as the individual reaches a point where they can't stand it any longer and suddenly go out of control with spending or drinking. Then the individual feels guilty for doing this and returns to a state of mind of needing to deprive themselves in order to feel good again. And it becomes this vicious cycle of being in control and then being out of control. And it's very common in our society, especially among professionals who are so overworked and struggling to make ends meet or who are working at jobs where they feel unappreciated to have these excessive out of control aspects of their lives which are rooted in compulsive deprivation. As Dr. Carnes points out in his book, quote, wherever addiction is, there will also be deprivation. If not addictive in its own right, the deprivation becomes a life pattern that, in part, is a solution to traumatic experience, end quote. What are the characteristics of trauma deprivation? People deny themselves basic needs like groceries, shoes, books, medical care, rent, or heat. Avoid any sexual pleasure or feel extreme remorse over any sexual activity. Hoard money and avoid spending money on legitimate needs. Perform underachieving jobs compulsively and make consistently extreme or unwarranted sacrifices for work. Spoil success opportunities. Have periods of no interest in eating and attempt diets repeatedly. Seek comfort, luxuries, and play activities as frivolous. Routinely skip vacations because of dedication to an unrewarding task. They avoid normal activities because of fears. Have difficulty with play. Be underemployed. Vomit food or use diuretics to avoid weight gain. These are the characteristics of someone who is utilizing trauma deprivation. Now, let's take a look at trauma shame. And as I have discussed regarding shame, it is a profound sense that you are unworthy of love and belonging. You feel defective, or even worse, you feel responsible for the trauma which happened, and therefore the shame is coupled with a deep and corrosive self-hatred. A person who is shame-based has as, has as their core belief that they are unlovable and that if people knew who they really were behind the facade that they presented to them, <clears throat> they would leave in disgust. And there is a fundamental break with trust. The person doesn't believe anyone will truly care about them based on their own merits and will only exploit and magnify their unforgivable faults and hold them hostage to their failures in the past. Survivors will often try to overcompensate for this by doing everything within their power to meet the unreachable standards of others and who they want them to be in order to gain their love and acceptance, only to fail miserably, which only adds to their existing shame. The whole binge purge phenomenon associated with addictive behavior which often follows a person who's experienced trauma, is deeply rooted in the shameful feelings one has about oneself. And at its worst, the shame-based person can be filled with so much self-hatred that the person feels they are absolutely worthless, totally unforgivable for what they may have done, been a part of, or had done to them, and the only solution to this merciless stance is suicide. The stance is far beyond depression and is often marked with a preoccupation and acting out of self-destructive behaviors. And these are the characteristics of trauma shame. Feeling ashamed because you believe trauma experiences were your fault. Feeling lonely and estranged from others because of traumatic experiences. Engaging in self-mutilating behaviors. You're cutting yourself, you're burning yourself, that kind of stuff. 
You're engaging in self-destructive behaviors. You're enduring physical or emotional pain that most people would not accept. You avoid mistake, you're avoiding mistakes at all costs. You're feeling that you should be punished for the traumatic event and being unable to forgive yourself. Feeling bad when something good happens. Having suicidal thoughts, threats, and attempts. Possessing no ability to experience normal emotions, such as sadness, anger, love, and happiness. Having a deep fear of depending on people. Feeling unworthy, unlovable, immoral, or sinful because of trauma experiences. Perceiving others always as happier, better, and more competent. Having a dim outlook for the future. And avoiding experiences that feel good, have no risk, and are self-nurturing. Folks, you cannot numb your feelings of unworthiness into submission. Whether you use alcohol, drugs, or another person, these coping strategies will make you vulnerable to addiction, codependency, and exploitation. And whatever the addiction may be, or whatever you use to bury the pain, pretty soon it will no longer be able to keep you from feeling those toxic emotions, and you will become desperate to find a solution. Better to face what needs to be faced and develop healthy coping strategies to deal with the trauma and pain of your past instead of ignoring the problem, and which ultimately and inevitably will put your life into a threatening situation. Let's look at trauma repetition. This is something that I've spoken about before in that we repeat behaviors and recreate situations in our lives over and over again until we transform them. Trauma repetition is about reenactment. We are living out our present lives in the unremembered past. We continue to relive a story from our painful history over and over again as we vainly try to find and bring some resolution to our pain and heal it. But instead, we keep recreating the same situations, finding ourselves with the same type of people without ever realizing we're stuck in a pattern of repetition. Or another form of reenactment is to abuse others the way others had abused you. You were victimized, and now you take on the role of perpetrator. Or you can play the role of rescuer coming in to save the person from the trauma they are experiencing. The hero who saves the day, who rescues the damsel in distress, or the wounded warrior. Now, whether you are playing the victim, the perpetrator, or the rescuer, you are attempting to bring resolution, healing, and a way to eliminate this deeply held fear that traumatized you somewhere in your past. But instead of healing the original traumatic wound, you deepen it and make it worse because you've added traumas on top of each other. So suddenly you're wrapped in this endless cycle of unconscious programs playing out in your mind and your life that spans lifetimes. Yes, I said lifetimes, and we'll get into that on another show. These traumas are carried with you in your soul, and you will continue to recreate these traumatic experiences on some level until you finally decide to heal it within yourself. Now, characteristics of trauma repetition are Doing something self-destructive over and over again, usually something that took place in your childhood and started with a trauma. Reliving a story from the past. Engaging in, a, in abusive relationships repeatedly. Repeating painful experiences, including specific behaviors, scenes, persons, and feelings. And doing something to others that you experienced as an early life trauma. So these are the different ways that we respond to trauma. Here are the, some of the steps that you can take on the path to recovery. And I just want to make sure that I make a quick announcement that we are broadcasting this show on KUHSDenver.com. That's KUHSDenver.com. We are originating here in Denver, Colorado, broadcasting all around the world, touching lives through music and programs like this. Uh, again, uh, www.kuhsdenver.com. It's the place to be and the place to go if you want to have great shows. So here are some steps to you that you can have for your recovery. If you recognize yourself in any or above 
all, any of these things that I've described to you, you can take steps right now to interrupt this pattern and put yourself on the path to recovery. And when I looked at all these lists, I found I'd used a combination of all these coping strategies to deal with the traumas that I'd experienced. And I was very humbled about what I learned about myself. I had to take a hard inventory about the kinds of behaviors that continued to bring me pain, what I call left turns, and discovered that if I continue to behave it that way, I respond, or respond in that way that I was going to be inevitably feeling this pain, this self-loathing, and this shame about who I was and, and the man I'd become. When I finally made a choice to stop this, to end this cycle of pain, although it was very difficult at first, the end result was miraculous. I found me. I found me. Underneath all this pain and trauma, there I was, the man who loved his family, loved his loved ones, his friends, his community, wanted to be of service, wanted to help make it a better planet. That's why I want to share with you, you know, the work that I do in my program. I know it works. If you want to work with me, call me. Get in contact. Instead of repeating these same behaviors and getting the same results, you need to develop other coping strategies that are healthy. You want to create a plan of action, one that we would agree to, where you have a mentor who can guide you and hold you accountable to a plan so you'll not fall back to old compulsive coping strategies that you have been doing that have been destructive to your quality of life. And after we've reconnected to who you truly are, we examine the traumas that have plagued you in your life. We reframe, reframe them, putting them into the larger context of your life, the big picture, and learn to get the good that came from those stories, came from those experiences. These stories you tell cannot survive empathy and unconditional love from someone trusted with the goal of your healing. You reclaim your connection to life and to another human being. And this begins a total dismantling of the past, and soon the shackles are unlocked and the past holds you down no more. And then we start to build new skill sets to bring out the person you already are who just got buried beneath all that trauma. We're going to rebuild you based on the work we do in reconnecting to who you truly are. Now, there are some things that immediate actions in Dr. Carnes's book that can, you can take based on the trauma categories that we described earlier. And I'm gonna give it to you quickly right now. A trauma reaction recovery plan. Learn to manage your reactivity by listing the ways you underreact or overreact, by describing what the reaction is, what the feeling is like, and what the behavior that results from it. Describe a specific event in which the reaction happened. Then describe what the appropriate response would have been and the probable result that would have happened if you did that. Your objective is to find the balanced response. The arousal recovery plan. First, take notice what arousal addictions you have in your life that you use to bring relief to the trauma and pain you've experienced. Then look at the intensity these arousal coping strategies had in your life. Did it truly bring you relief or did it just add to more problems? How did it affect your relationships with your family, your friends, your loved ones, your coworkers? What were the sources of your intensity? Make a list. And once you've done that, write a plan of action for distancing yourself from the addiction to the intensity. Be very specific. A blocking recovery plan. In this plan, you need to look at what satiation addictions you use to soothe and calm yourself. Anything you do to relax, medicate, or anesthetize anxiety to block out the trauma and pain. Make a list. Then write a plan for soothing and calming yourself in healthy ways. A splitting recovery plan. You got to look and examine the areas in your life where preoccupation and obsession is used to escape from reality. List this all out very clearly without hiding anything from yourself. Separate illusion from reality. Be very honest with yourself. Then once you've done that, you've got to compose a brief statement of 10 rules to stay in reality. And these are your new rules to live by. De deprivation recovery plan. In this plan, you want to look at the areas where you have gone far beyond neglect of yourself. You want to identify and list the forms of compulsive deprivation or self-harm that exists in your life. 
then after reviewing your list, you want to make a list of what's healthy, thoughtful, caring human being would do for his or herself. Then pick from that list three things you can do in the next week and three more you can do in the next month. The shame recovery plan. Here you want to begin the process of self-restoration. Begin by making a list of the sources of shame in your life, whether it was from an event, in a relationship, an error on your part. Think of all the times that you felt unworthy, ashamed, embarrassed, or flawed. Write it down. Jot down your feelings associated with each entry, and then ask your life coach or therapist or group what you need to do to rebuild your support for yourself. We're very thankful to Dr. Carnes. A repetition recovery plan, he has a great one in his book. I highly recommend it uh, if, you, if you want to find out, but that's also the work that I do. I mean, that's the program is designed, my program is designed to liberate you from repeating the traumas over and over again by transforming them. Now, what I want to focus on right now is how do we embrace our tragedies and make peace with our past? And this is a hard concept to get a, a, to wrap ourselves around. And before we start, let me make sure again that I make a quick announcement. We are broadcasting from KUHSDenver.com. KUHSDenver.com, bringing you great original music, great programming here in Colorado, all across the nation, all around the world. Uh, I want to thank all of you who are tuning in and listening to this show. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. So when we're embracing our tragedies and making peace with our past, it, this is not easy. It requires a willingness to see things differently a willingness to be guided into the dark recesses of our past and make meaning of the experience. In order for us to transform our wounds and heal our pain, we must find the courage to go back and extract the good that came out of those experiences, find the gifts and the wounds, and turn our suffering into blessings. Now, whether it's with me or with someone else, the person you choose must have earned your trust. They have earned the right to hear your story, and they stand as a sacred witness to the encounter with the beast, or what I like to call our shadow. Now, there is no person who understands the necessity for going into the shadow and finding its gifts than the work of the late Debbie Ford. And she is one of my most honored teachers and was instrumental. She was very instrumental in helping me to understand the shadow and to develop my healing process. Debbie Ford's life work was focused on understanding the shadow. And the shadow is something we almost faced. All those who have experienced any kind of trauma. And for some, it's going to be the encounter with the beast. Others, it's going to be those things about ourselves that we don't want to admit. Or we hide from others. The shadow is secretive. It's everything we don't want other people to see or know about us. It's the thing we lie about to others. It's what we lie about to ourselves, and it's what we are hiding. The I Ching says, quote, It is only when we have the courage to face things exactly as they are, without any self-deception or illusion, that a light will develop out of the events by which the path to success may be recognized. For time's sake, I'm going to go through some highlights of a movie called The Shadow Effect that Debbie Ford produced before she, she passed, um, which I have all my clients watch, and I want to encourage all of you uh, to watch it yourselves. It's fantastic. Uh, and it's important to look at it before you go into your traumas, your past, and start doing this work. It will give you some awareness of things that you may not, not have known before, and it will help ease the process of navigating through those dark recesses those secrets that you keep from yourself and from others. Now I'm going to hit on some of the key notes from the film that I believe will be of much value to you. My goal is to give you, so that you receive valuable information that you can immediately utilize in your lives as you begin to face your shadows. Again, I do not recommend doing this alone. It's tough work. And you got to find someone you can relate to, someone who understands and who has been there, who gets it, who gets it, and who will stand with you as a sacred and honored witness as you travel through the underworld and retrieve your light back. 
To experience one aspect of the soul, you have to experience its counterforce. Now, the shadow comes from thoughts, from emotions, from impulses we find are so repulsive and are distasteful to accept. So instead of dealing with them, we repress them. And it shows up as drinking too much, cheating on your wife or your spouse, or getting into fights, screaming at your kids, verbally abusing your partners. And it can even get to the point where it's dangerous, where you are thinking of taking someone else's life. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people living in denial of their own shadow. And all of us are being affected by the collective shadow. And it's, this is how it shows up. This is how it manifests. It manifests as evil. It manifests as war. It manifests as terrorism. It manifests as social injustice. It manifests as fundamentalism. The birth of the shadow begins when we are very young. And we don't have the rational mind quite developed yet to filter out the messages that are coming in, and we are shamed for behaviors that we do. Now, these messages get ingrained in our subconscious, and like a virus, it gets stuck there and sabotages our sense of self. It wounds our otherwise healthy egos, and then we end up suppressing these qualities. We don't want others to see these qualities in us. So we end up building a false self around it. We build this false self around these negative ideas we have about ourselves to show everyone we meet that we are not this person. We create these personas so that we can belong. We build masks and live life behind them. And they become our prisons. And when we deny ourselves an outlet for our dark sign, it builds up and builds up, and it becomes a very powerful force that is capable of destroying not only ourselves, but the lives of others as well. The highest moral act that a human being can do is to own their own shadow. You have to own your own shadow. You've got to be willing to do it. And if you can own your own shadow, and if everyone else does that, we reclaim more light, more joy, more peace in the world. You are either going to use it or it is going to use you. As my dear friend and uh, fellow healer, uh, Miguel Rivera, who was on the show just uh, a, couple, a couple shows back, uh, who runs the purification ceremonies, he says, quote, The beast is a propellant. If it's not related to you, it will come after you. End quote. We must find a way to be make friends with it. And by uniting the head with the heart, gain control of the shadow part of our own humanity without allowing it to dominate us or control us. The purpose of confronting our shadows is to complete our initiation, our transformation. We lost our innocence during the events which traumatized us. And these shadows of the past haunt us until we face them. And we need courage compassion, and empathy for ourselves as we do this. The key, though, is when we meet our shadows, we mustn't stay stuck, and we must find the meaning in the experience. When we are able to identify the meaning these experiences had for us, we come to understand both good and evil and the part we play. We then can begin the process of transforming ourselves through integration of the lessons learned which allows the charge of the past to fall away as our souls become larger than the event that occurred and we are wiser for the experience. And then we can use these experiences to bring about the greatest good for all within the community. Folks, every quality you see in someone else is in you. The sinner and the saint. Someone who is worthy and someone who is unworthy. Someone who is lovable and someone who is unlovable. Someone who is brilliant, someone who is stupid. Who is a winner, who is a loser. Who is kind, who is mean. Who is selfish or who is selfless. Who is forgiving, who is blaming. We possess it all. We are everything. 
rather than confronting our own darkness, we, we end up doing is we project these unwanted qualities onto others. And when we project these unwanted qualities onto others, we lose bits and pieces of ourselves. And these others hold onto some of our unclaimed light as well because we projected it away. What we judge in others or condemn is a disowned part of ourselves. And we attack it because it is the part in us that we hate. And this is a really important part to get. When we react to a projection, you become that projection. When you react with an equal force to the aggressor, you become the aggressor. See, I think it's important to understand what the difference is between a response and a reaction. To the root word of response is responsibility. It comes from a French word which means standing on principle. So when you are responding, you're coming from a place of being. So for instance, my being now is stable, at peace, connected, creating harmony. These are the principles I stand for. And when I'm responding, I'm responding from that space. At least I try to. I'm not always successful, but at least I try to. I'm breathing in. I'm checking in on an unconscious, subconscious level with my principles, and then I'm responding. When you react, there is an action happening, which is reenacting a belief system, an exchange. A reaction is taking an action that has occurred before and happening again. It's an automatic way of being for us, for society. It's not principle-based. So what you want to do is re-stand a principle. you got to dig in deep and find a principle that you connect with. You're constantly looking at what do I stand for? What do I stand for? Every moment, what do I stand for? What do I stand for? And as other things come up, and they are going to come up, you got to dig back into the work the bliss list you created, the value system that you're creating for yourself, the, the person that you want to be, and everything is an opportunity to reflect, to share, to connect with what you stand for. Everything is trying to give you something, and this includes the yelling, the screamings, and the traumas. Because if we don't face what is in us that needs to be faced, the darkness, and shine a light in the dark, light a light in the dark, by ignoring these destructive patterns and impulses in you, you will self-destruct. You will implode rather than explode. Traumas, folks, affect our brains. They change our brain functions. And consequently, this changes the chemicals and hormones released into the body, which is not a good thing. So it's really important to express healthily any kind of pain. Without that expression and how we express it, it stays with us. It gets lodged in the body and causes us to react and behave unconsciously. And if these emotions and what you think, the things that have not been processed from the pains and traumas of your past, it will pollute your system. And these are the most toxic things to our bodies and lead to all the physical, emotional, and psychological impairments that show up later in life. Our thoughts and emotions affect the organs of the body. It's there's indisputable evidence. And if we repress our anger, it might seem like it's a good solution, but pretty soon we run out of places to hide. By repressing our shadow, it can lead to destructive behaviors. We have to resolve the undigested emotions that are in our bodies and dislodge the stress in our minds. We have to unearth, own, and embrace the very parts of ourselves that have caused us the most pain. And the moment we do, the light of our awareness will begin the process of transforming them. Everyone here who's listening has gone through some kind of trauma. And if we dig deep enough, there is gold to be found in those experiences. Bad experiences can be enlightening experiences because they help us to be who we are. They help us to become more compassionate, more forgiving, more loving. So the goal that we seek, it's hidden there within the dark. And in order to do that, you have to embrace our, your totality, all that you have disowned, all, any, all that we do. 
we, have, we will experience that freedom and then we can embrace it with love. And the more we move through those shadows of the past, the painful memories and those experiences, the more light you're going to reclaim that belongs to you, that's your right, that's your inheritance. And we do this kind of work, leading you through your underworld to reclaim your light, to get you to the point of catharsis, which is that true moment of forgiving, which is that purging, that cleansing, that deep soul release that sets you free. You forgive yourself, you forgive others, and you are transforming that pain into the material to be used for your, your, the manifestation of your life, the full embodiment, the greatest version of yourself, the greatest expression of yourself. You don't have to carry the shame with you all alone. You don't have to keep it secret. And these are people out there who are willing to shine a light for you. To so show that you are something who you really are beyond your shadow. And you've got to fight your way out of the darkness. You've got to light your way out of the darkness. And that's, I honor people when I work with them in that way, in that most vulnerable level, because I understand. I've been there. And I walk with you step by step to get you to the other side. I took my own medicine, and I'm not asking anyone to do anything that they haven't done, that I haven't done. Uh, and we will learn together and find what you need to learn that gives value to your experience and helps you to transform these wounds into gifts. Now, Debbie Ford reminds us in the film, quote, that forgiveness doesn't happen in your head until it happens in your heart, end quote. Now, before we close the show, I want to move on to a quick exercise that I want to be able to give all of you um, so that you can go. And this is one of the most important things to help you unlock the prison doors uh, that might keep you locked in your painful recycling of memories, triggers, and images from your past. Uh, and it's a process one, bit one must be willing to go through and have the commitment and dedication to do it. You must want to heal more than anything and be willing to invest the time into your own healing for yourself and for others. When you look at your traumas and when you are working with me or when you're doing this, uh, please don't do this on your own. Find somebody who to do this with. Look at all of them and ask the question, what would you like to reshape? With just this one question, you give yourself the opportunity to reshape all of your conflicts. You want to look back at all the conflicts in your life and at the genesis of the conflict and where it began. And then you're going to write an essay about it. And at the top of the paper, you're going to write, I am whole. I choose this experience just the way it is. And you put that at the top of the page, and then you write about it. And what you take from the experience. It's important to take the time and find the gifts wrapped up in the tragedy. You know, ask yourself these questions. You know, what, when you're going through this part of your life, what is the gift how does it serve me? What is it trying to teach me? When you're looking for the gifts and the wounds, there is something to be found there. It's our secrets that keep us sick, folks. You unlock those secrets. And while you're doing this, resist all temptation to shame yourself. Shame is the lowest energy of the universe. It keeps us locked into doing things over and over again. Shame is a destructive force the most painful feeling in all the universe. And it co is connected to this feeling of unworthiness. A healthy shame is designed to support us when we are behaving well or badly. However, when it becomes negative, it will destroy. And the antidote for shame is true empathy. Shame cannot survive empathy. You must have compassion for yourself as you work through these dark places and have someone there who has empathy and love and is totally unconditional and non-judgmental to guide you through to the other side. The only thing we must heal within ourselves is to tell the truth. Liars don't heal. We must tell the truth. To become an honest person, we must own our own shadows. We must own our own darkness and bring the light of truth to the darkness. When you shine the light there, when you light up the darkness, you will realize there was nothing there. The darkness goes away because ultimately the darkness is nothing. It's only the absence of light. So you've got to tell the whole truth from your whole heart. That's the courage. Speak the truth of your experience from your whole heart. And as the adage goes, it will set you free. 
That gold is in that dark there. And you, there's things there that will be found which can help you to detoxify these toxic emotions that keep you imprisoned by these events. There's something there to teach you. There's something there to reclaim. There, trust in the process when you write these stories out. Trust in the things I'm asking you to do. It's one of the most effective ways in which I healed myself by examining the areas of my life that had traumatized, traumatized me and found the lessons to be learned. When I got that lesson, it broke the emotional and psychological stranglehold these events held on me. And like a river of ice, which suddenly breaks, the water began to flow again. The ice began to melt and flow and joy and life returned. This process works. Quickly, I want to say something about emotional triggers. Emotional triggers, whenever you feel triggered, these are alarms. They are cues to your shadows. They are cues to the secrets of your past. They actually have nothing to do with what is going on in front of you right now. It has something to do with what happened in the past. It shows you something you need to uncover and reclaim about yourself. So when triggers come up, start identifying them and go back to where it originated. Put down the internal bat and investigate where and how this began, how it has affected your life, and uncover what it is trying to teach you. One of the keys for this process to work is you must take full ownership of your life, all of it. Being at the source of your own life, you are finally able to make the changes necessary to bring about the things you want to experience. And to clear up the past, you must own up to the part that you played in it and that on some level, you co-created it. This will be different for each individual. We are not the same. Your story is your story. My story is my story. Your traumas are your traumas. My traumas are my traumas. You know you have grown beyond what has happened to you when you can stand up and say, this is my past, this is what happened, and I am a better for the experience. It has given me everything I need to be the greatest version of myself today. I am grateful for it all. I wouldn't change a thing. The most commonly suppressed emotions turn toxic when we suppress them. You've got to take on the self-hate, the guilt, the shame, the anger, the jealousy, the, all the fears of abandonment. You've got to see it for what it is. All the hurt, the hopelessness, the sadness, the jealousy, anger. You want to ask yourself when confronted by these messengers, what would you want to have me see? What would I have to know to digest enough of my history that is stored in my body so that these new emotions that are opened up, these new feelings, that they aren't triggered by the 42 events in my past? You've got to look at your negative emotions, not as enemies, but as friends trying to tell you something. They're trying to guide you, help you, and support you into becoming something better, something greater. And another great question to ask yourself when you're looking at these events is, what do you think you made it mean about you when this happened? What do you think you made it mean about you when this happened? Did you shame yourself? Did you think yourself a, a bad person, a failure, a reject, someone unworthy of love, a killer? The story is emotionally charged by the meaning you have given it. You want to understand what you made it mean about you and why you no longer believe this to be true, utilizing universal spiritual principles and truths based on love, peace, and forgiveness as the new baseline in your life. No one religion has a stranglehold on all universal truths. They exist in all faiths, all religions. So find it for you. Eventually, when you have purged the story on your paper, the next step is you want to reduce these painful stories to their elementary facts. You made it mean something about you that was going on back then. And because you haven't fully digested it, it keeps coming back until you get it. Folks, we all have a unique recipe. You must learn to love those parts of you that you have disowned. You have to got to integrate them back into you. Discover as you're writing these traumas out the good that came out of it. How did you grow? 
What did you become good at? What lessons did you learn? What are you grateful for? What wisdom can you gain that I can share with others? There's life wisdom to the game. Folks, as we're closing out the show, I just want you to know that we learn our lessons in the valley, not on the mountaintop. And if we don't learn how to forgive ourselves and others, the train stops. So look at life, at your life, and the wisdom you can take away from the experiences or the experience. What was this experience designed to teach you? What is the lesson to be learned that you can extract from the experience and turn into blessings? What did you gain? What qualities did you develop? What relationships opened up to you as a result of this experience? And what do you now know as a result of having this experience? How can this wisdom contribute to your future, your family's future, and the future of the community, of the nation, of the world? And how can it alter the way you see yourself, the way you see others? How can you make the biggest impact to change people's lives for the better? These questions, along with others I spoke about earlier, you need to ask yourself as you examine the traumas in your life. Again, I do not recommend doing it alone. If you want to work with me, I'm taking on new clients. Go to my website, www.charliepacello.com. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-P-A-C-E-L-L-O.com. Find me. We can work anywhere in the world. We can make it happen. This is challenging work. Ease into it. Be gentle and kind when you're with yourself when these emotions come up, and they will. Feel them. Take a break. Let them come out. Run their course. And when you come back to a place of balance and equanimity, return to the work. Get to the cause and the source of the pain and uproot it. Go at your own pace and leave no stone unturned. The reward of total freedom, peace, and release from your past awaits you on the other end. All right, folks, that's today's show. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, KUHS Denver for hosting this show, for being here, for allowing me to be able to broadcast to people all over the world. Um, the numbers on this show continue to rise. I am so grateful to each and every one of you. Without you, um, this wouldn't be possible. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for being here and spending your Friday afternoons with me. Next show, we are going to continue with our, our theme on trauma. And I have a wonderful guest who's coming on. She is a, a therapist named J.C. Tremont. And she works here in the Colorado area. And she's going to not only talk about how she helps her clients with trauma and anxiety and cultivating confidence. Uh, but we're going to talk about how she uses equine facilitated psychotherapy, which is the opportunity to learn and be healed by horses. So please tune in to our next show here on the council. May you all be well. May you all be free of pain and suffering. May you all be whole. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful weekend. God bless in all that you do. The council is adjourned. We'll see you next week. Two weeks. We'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> all right, folks. Be well. <laughs>